Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Jews, in today's gospel lesson, refused to believe Jesus' word. And in their unbelief, they revile him. They cast their vitriol upon him. They call him a sinner. Although, Jesus says, none of you can convict me of sin. And they slander him. They say just the same thing that they said two weeks ago in the gospel lesson for Oculi. He has a demon. In fact, two weeks ago we heard them say with a little bit more, with a little more detail, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, above the ruler of demons. And just as two weeks ago, he shut down that accusation by pointing out that their own sons cast out demons, and if they cast them out, by Beelzebub. If, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, then by whom did your son cast out? Today he simply tells them, I do not have a demon. The accusation of having a demon, though, persists simply because their hatred and dishonoring of Jesus persists. They then accuse him of being a Samaritan, a member of God's, or rather someone who is not a member of God's chosen people, but one who likes to think that he is. Jesus responds to all of their hateful slander very simply. I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me, and I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. He tells them that by dishonoring him, they are dishonoring his Father in heaven, the one who does seek Christ's glory, the one who does judge men's hearts. So... He is, in essence, telling them that they are committing a great sin, the sin of blasphemy, dishonoring the one whom the Father has sent, and therefore dishonoring the one who seeks his glory, and the one whom the judge sends. And yet, in spite of their sin, in spite of their unbelief and blasphemy towards Jesus and the Father, Christ still presents them with the promise of life and with the means of acquittal for their sins. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. He invites these men to hear the words of God that he speaks, keeping his word, which means to consent to it, to believe it, and then to hide it in one's heart so that it becomes the heart's meditation to do this with the word of God which Jesus preaches. That saves men so that they will never see death. Those who hear God's words from the lips of Christ and those who keep it in their hearts and in their lives will never see death. Yet in their unbelief, even in the midst of Christ's genuine desire for their salvation, they still understand Jesus carnally. They, mean, they assume Jesus means that his word will keep them from physical death at the end of their lives. And that's ridiculous. Abraham, after all, is dead. The prophets are dead. And yet this man here says that his word can save men from death. Abraham received God's word and kept it, and still he died. Moses records not only his death in the book of Genesis, but also precisely where the patriarch is buried, in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite. The prophets, too, received God's word and preached it and lived it in faith. They spoke that very word of God to Israel, and yet where are they to this day? Dead, often at the hands of the unbelieving Israelites. Abraham and the prophets, they had God's word and they kept it, and yet they died. And so these Jews, listening to Jesus' words in today's gospel lesson, can only ask, who do you make yourself out to be? Who do you think you are? Since Jesus, after all, is claiming to be greater than their ancestors who had God's word. But Jesus doesn't make himself out to be anyone. He doesn't need to honor himself. He doesn't need to glorify himself so that other people will believe him. He says, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. This happened first at Jesus' baptism, 
when heaven was open and God the Father testified in a loud voice so that everyone present could hear, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He testified again for his Son Jesus Christ upon the Mount of Transfiguration for the three disciples who were there, again repeating his good pleasure. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased and adding the words, hear him. In John 5, 36, Jesus goes on to tell the disciples that not only has the Father borne witness to him and honored him, but the very works that I do, he says, these works bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Jesus has no need to honor himself. The Father glorifies the Son because they are of the same essence. And so they share the same glory. They share the same honor in all things. And Jesus directs their gaze and their thoughts to that very point then, when he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham looked forward to Jesus' day. How did this happen? The Lord told Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 3, which we heard read a moment ago, In you all families of the earth shall be blessed. And he specifies even further in Genesis 22, 18, In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And that seed isn't Isaac, nor is it the sons of Jacob, nor is it the people of Israel. But St. Paul reminds us in Galatians 3.16, he does not say, and to seeds as many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. God reveals Jesus' work to Abraham thousands of years before God the Son would become incarnate. And he gave Abraham a picture, a foreshadowing of the ministry of God the Son, what he would do in the days of his flesh by commanding him to sacrifice his only begotten son, Isaac, on Mount Moriah. Abraham looked forward to Jesus' day. He saw Jesus' day typified in that sacrifice, and by faith he saw it and rejoiced in it because he saw how his seed Christ would be a blessing to all families of the earth, atoning for the sins of all mankind, so that all who believe in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. Just as the Jews thought Jesus' word was the antidote from physical death, so they misunderstand G Jesus' words about Abraham as well. Abraham, he saw Jesus' day because God revealed it to him. And yet they turn Jesus' words around once again in their mind, and they say, how is it that he, Jesus, has seen Abraham? And so they misunderstand his words about his own word, about the Father's witness, and now about Abraham. But yet Christ then speaks clearly to them, plainly, so that they cannot misunderstand it all. Before Abraham was, I am. Abraham came into being. Abraham was created. But Jesus is the eternal Son of God, the Father, without beginning and without end. This is then why keeping Jesus' word is the same as hearing and keeping God's word. It's, this is why those who keep Jesus' word will never see death. For he told us in John chapter 5, verse 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Jesus' word, it doesn't make anyone immune from physical death any more than Jesus, keeping his Father's words, made him immune from physical death. No, he speaks of eternal death and everlasting life. In John 5, 24, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Hearing and believing Christ's words brings the forgiveness of sins by which we shall not enter into the judgment. Nor will those who believe in Christ's words see death because by faith the one who believes has passed from death to life already. The Jews misunderstand the nature of the life that Jesus brings because they misunderstand who Jesus is. That he is the eternal Son of God who has life in himself and who gives that life 
to those who hear and keep and treasure his word. The murder that the Jews have already been harboring in their heart, then at that point, erupts into their hands. They pick up stones to throw at Jesus. They're going to kill him precisely in that moment, at that spot, because he is now claimed to be God himself. But it is not the hour for Jesus' death. And so he hides himself. He conceals himself and leaves the temple, passing through their midst. They don't succeed in murdering Jesus at this time, but they will succeed in murdering Christ. Not because of their schemes or their conniving, not because of their superior planning, or not because of Jesus falling into their trap, but because Christ himself will allow himself to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. He will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, he tells us to the disciples, long before the Jews ever apprehend him. Even though he has life in himself, because he is the eternal Son of God, he will yet offer himself into death as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Even though he is the light and life of men as the eternal Son of God, he will die and suffer greatly beforehand so that he may obtain an eternal redemption. St. Paul says in the epistle lesson, For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It is precisely because of who he is that this is possible. It is precisely because he is the eternal Son of God, made flesh and blood, that his blood can cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that his blood can cleanse our consciences from dead works and the guilt of our sins. His blood cleanses us from all our unrighteousness, from all our impurity, from all our transgression, from all our guilt, and from all of the shame that we have brought upon ourselves with our sins. When the Jews do finally succeed in killing Christ through Pilate, it is only because it is the will of the triune God that Christ died, not to, not, not to placate the hatred of the Jews, but for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Jesus says to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. His word is the promise of the forgiveness of sins and the promise of a perfect righteousness given and bestowed freely upon all who are truly penitent. For keeping his word brings you out of death into life. Because as we heard at the very beginning of Lent, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And believing this, that his word is our life, we confess along with Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. His word is life. Because by faith in his word, that's how he applies his precious atoning blood to us, so that he purifies us by forgiving our sins, by declaring us to be righteous. And so that we, by keeping that word of the gospel in faith, we have everything that he earns for us and everything that he promises us. He gives us all of this by faith. So that where there is the forgiveness of sins, there is the promise of salvation. And where there is forgiveness of sins and the promise of salvation, there is also new life. Although we die like Abraham, and although we die as the prophets die, yet we will live with Christ in paradise and await the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting just as Abraham and the prophets now do. But that new life that Christ brings does not simply begin the moment of our death, nor at the moment of the resurrection of the body on the last day. That new life begins today. And every time we confess our sins and believe in the that the cleansing blood of Jesus purifies us from all unrighteousness, 
For with conscience is cleansed from the dead works of sin and the guilt and the shame that those dead works bring upon us, we then receive the Holy Spirit and live by the Holy Spirit, abstaining from those dead works of sin. And as Paul says, we serve the living God who gives us new life, who fills us with this Holy Spirit so that we each day abstain from the dead works of sin, so that we each day honor the triune God, so that we each day keep his word in faith, not only in our hearts, but also by our behavior. Like Abraham, because we too, like him, live by faith in the Son of God, we rejoice to see Jesus' day as it is recorded in the Gospels. We rejoice once again to celebrate his passion and his death and his resurrection, not just during Passion Tide, but each and every day of our lives, because his passion, his death, and his resurrection, that is our eternal redemption that he obtains for us. That is the source of our new life in this life, and that is the source of our everlasting life, by which we shall never see death. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.